And we've said right from the beginning, we don't want any disruptions in, in the school. We want to make sure the, the students have a good experience along with the certainty for the parents. It turns out that if the Ontario government won't lock down the province, the unions were prepared to do it. So who's really in charge here? A democratically elected government or these private and public sector unions? Mary Ugolini here with Rebel News bringing you an update on the socio-political dumpster fire that has been riddling the province of Ontario since last Friday, November the 4th. All across Canada, public and private sector unions were colluding to shut down the province of Ontario in defiance of what is being referred to as unconstitutional infringements of workers' rights by the Doug Ford Progressive Conservative government. Yet those very same unions have been silent at the very least or at the very worst, in favor of indiscriminate COVID-19 vaccine mandates that saw the mass discrimination and termination of workers based on personal and confidential medical choices. Bodily autonomy, a right to informed choice, both things apparently not constitutionally protected, but wage raises to compensate for inflation due to lockdowns that they all complied with, is kosher, I guess. It all started when Canada's largest union, that's the Canadian Union of Public Employees, acronymed CUPE, proposed an 11% raise for all of their members every year for the next four years in response to contract negotiations that began on August 31st. When negotiations continued to fall apart at the end of October and strike action was announced, Premier of Ontario Doug Ford introduced heavy-handed legislation under Bill 28 titled Keeping Students in Class Act, which condemned the strike as illegal and imposed hefty fines on union members, up to $4,000 a day. The union then changed their semantics and called the strike a political protest instead. Apparently, this was all for the children. Can you believe it? The same children who have been out of school more in the last two years than they've been in, thanks to this same government's COVID-19 response plans. Children in Ontario were victims of the harshest and longest and arguably most unscientific school closures in all of North America. We started a petition earlier this year to get them back in the classroom at backtoclass.ca. You can head over there and view my previous reports on the subject and sign our petition if you think that children's right to access a free public education should be prioritized and that they should remain in the classroom, in person, unabated. In response to the legislation tabled by the Ford government, CUPE called this a, quote, call to arms for union members, unquote. Protesters took to the streets in Toronto on Saturday, November the 5th. They shut down a major intersection at Young and Dundas Square, which inevitably caused traffic chaos, and the general vice president for CUPE's Ontario Executive Board, that's Fred Hahn, addressed the crowd with radical language about fighting and winning in this fight against a democratically elected government, which really leaves one wondering, especially after the invocation of essentially martial law against the trucker protest earlier this year, could this be the face of a brewing insurrectionist? I mean, have a look for yourselves. of these actions we will keep moving we will keep building because we know when we stand together and when we fight together we will win together fred hahn says that he cares about workers rights but qp ontario explicitly counter protested the trucker convoy that took to ottawa to protest the same infringements of the government on their right to bodily autonomy and again, informed choice. This same union called them white supremacists, bigots, members held signs like pro-vaccines and anti-fascists while bigotedly supporting vaccine mandates and aligning with the smearing, censoring, and otherwise silencing of anyone who so much as questioned the scientific rationale or ethics of this response, almost like a fascist. Nonetheless, the union flexed its muscles and received $1 million in funding 
from the British Columbia Teachers Federation to continue their potentially illegal strike or protest, whatever they're calling it now. They received an additional $100,000 from Unifor to offset the potential fines they were generating. Citing escalation if the government doesn't back down, the combined $1.1 million in funding can be loosely defined as financial interference to support efforts to resist a democratically elected government's apparently overreaching infringements, yet none of the participants had their bank accounts freezed, were fined, or imprisoned. The Ford government has instead promised to revoke Bill 28 so long as QP continues negotiations and ends their strike or political protest. Oddly, this was the same offer put on the table last week, too, which QP said no and decided to strike anyway. So this disruptive closure of schools could have all been avoided if the union had have just agreed to what they just agreed to this week, last week. For now, Ontario school children are back to class, at least temporarily and hopefully uninterrupted. That is, until the teacher contracts are up in February of 2023. But all is suffice to say, who runs this province? A democratically elected government or these powerful public and private sector unions with seemingly endless funding? For Rebel News, I'm Tamara Ugolini. Head on over to our petition at backtoclass.ca. At that special website, you can stay up to date on all of our reports and help give a voice to the kids who want to be in school, doing in-person, in-class learning by signing our petition. That website again is backtoclass.ca.